And if, uh, if you're not familiar with IOD Malta's 859 Club, this is a club we started last year where we can talk about uh, issues of, of immediate concern to the director community in Malta. And this uh, platform has been growing uh, quite rapidly over, over the last 18 months or so. Uh, we've now moved online, but previously these were physical meetings. All, also, if you're not familiar with the IOD, uh, we are an active organization here on the Maltese Islands. We are running the Charter Director Program, if this is something that you would like to take part in to improve your uh, skills in different areas of, of corporate governance. Uh, we'd very much like to hear from you. And today I'm absolutely delighted to welcome uh, uh, a most distinguished panel of speakers. We've got uh, Sonny Portelli, who was the former chair of HSBC Malta. We have the current chair of APS Bank, Frederick Masood Monici, and uh, a new face to IOD events, the CEO at Malta Government Investments, Harold Bonici. So welcome to all the speakers, welcome to all of you, uh, some who may be joining for the first time. We would like to encourage you, if you do have questions, please put them into the chat stream on the side of the, uh, the Zoom panel. So with that, I think we'll we kick off because we've lost uh, a few minutes time in getting started today. Um, Sonny, there, there's an old saying, it's not the strongest that survive, but those that most readily adapt to change. With, with, uh, with this COVID-19 pandemic, what, what has changed and what needs to change on boards? Okay, thank you, Edwin, and um, a very good afternoon to everybody. Um, trust you are all well and in good health. Well, I think we are all in agreement of one thing, that this is uh, the greatest challenge that society is facing and uh, corporates are particularly hit by it. And I think I won't be exaggerating if I say that I think everybody seems to be in agreement that this is the biggest challenge to anything since the end of World War II. So, I think long, medium and small corporates have been impacted and in the majority of cases have sustained major damage. Um, according to research carried out by Ernst & Young, only 19% of businesses prior to COVID um, were frequently performing simulation exercises, stress testing and um, scenario analysis. Consequently, uh, the virus has all of a sudden imposed change. There's no question that, you know, getting accustomed to it, it's been imposed very suddenly. And I think very suddenly, boards and senior managements are having to adjust to this new and, and very difficult reality. I think uh, when you sit around the boardroom table and you suddenly realize that um, your supply, supply chains are, are strained or disappearing altogether, you suddenly have major liquidity concerns, you have financial strains, you have absent employees, or a lot of employees are moving to remote workings. You have cyber risk, and everything else, the list is, is endless. So boards have no choice, but they have to, to change and to adapt to the new reality. They have to interact more closely with management without interfering or intervening too much in the management, in the day-to-day -day management of the business. 
And here I cannot emphasize too much the manifest, management's response has to be rooted in a crystal clear understanding of their role as a board and as individual directors. They have to remember that the board is the ultimate steward body of the company and its job and its mission is the uh, one of guiding and supporting management. In such crises, the board needs cool heads, detachment and good judgment. Above all, it needs a good chair who is wise, experienced, is a good communicator and above all, a strong and trusted leader. The board must continue to set the tone from the top must also balance its support with continuing challenges to management. It needs to have a peer, uh, clear perspective of the dilemmas facing the management. And in particular, the board must consider a range of what if scenarios, which management may be reluctant or too busy to consider. The board needs to keep a close eye on its succession plans. Hopefully they exist. Just in case, and this is not a remote case, some key members of the board itself or of management either falter or fall through uh, by the wayside, either through pressure or through sickness. And ultimately, the board must always keep in sight the big picture. And here, is the board's true strength. Its strength is through its diversity, by the diversity of its members, their ability to bring in the outside to the inside in perspective when confronting this unprecedented crisis. Um, these are the thoughts that come to mind. These are, this is what change is, is bringing about to boardrooms. And this is what the amount of adapting that is having to take place. And uh, at this point, I, I yield to my colleagues. Sonny, we've, we've begun with a, a literal tornado of uh, foreboding and uh, great concern. In, in, in your view, how, how well aligned are uh, the public policy announcements with what's actually happening in the business community? Well, um, I hope I haven't painted uh, too, too bleak a picture, <laughs> but I don't see too many bright lights. I mean, whenever I read the Financial Times, as I do every morning, or The Economist, which I get every week, or listen to CNN, or everything else, nobody has, seems to have a big smile on his face, apart, apart from Trump, probably. But anyway, that's, that's another thing. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it's, uh, look, if, if boards and uh, corporates and managements have been caught unawares, I have no doubt that our political leaders were likewise caught out of wicket. And I think they, they are learning on the hoof. And I don't mean this in this respect because I don't think there was any other way. And uh, so I think the, um, their pronouncements, their actions are getting clearer uh, day by day. You know, if, if you go by their first, or uh, if you go back few weeks, they weren't clear at all. They, obviously, they did not have a plan. Obviously, they did not know how long this thing was going to last. They had absolutely no clue about how well set up the hospitals were. And rightly enough, their, their first concern must have been public health. Because if you look beyond our shores, I think we should thank St. Paul or all these saints who've been protecting us throughout these years that um, we seem to have, you know, done quite well, uh, especially on the, on the health side. And this is all thanks to uh, the splendid teams that we have manning our hospitals, all glory to them and thanks. 
So I think the messaging is getting clearer and clearer and clearer. Um, it's a new administration. It's a young administration. And I, I, I say again, I mean no disrespect. In fact, I say this um, in, in, in all that these guys seem to be managing. But they are, they are learning on the hoof, as they say. Day by day, you can see that um, the messaging is getting clearer, is getting more focused. And uh, what, what's, what's a good thing that I, is, that I see is that there's a two-way conversation. I mean, the chamber is doing a great job. The, um, the people in tourism who, who represent such uh, an important uh, component in, in our country's GDP. Um, and I, I had the pleasure of spending a large part of my career in that side, on that side of the fence. There are some excellent professionals on that side of the fence, and no doubt they are making their voices heard and they are giving uh, the sort of advice that our political leaders need. I, I have hopes that at the end of the day, we will be able to look back. There will be a lot of lessons learned on every side, on, on, on the side of the politicians, the side of the national executive on the corporate side and hopefully these lessons will not need to be revisited very very quickly hopefully not in my lifetime but um, it will probably teach us how to be as far as we on the school today are concerned to be better members of boards we will be able to see how boards should look like. And for those uh, who are also involved in management, you know, this new dimension to management, the importance of stress testing, the importance of looking beyond the obvious and always thinking about the what if, about tomorrow, because tomorrow is going to come sooner or later whether it's a virus or whether it's whatever is going to come. Uh, Thank you, Evan. I think uh, uh, one lesson to, to take from, from this is that we, we all need to learn how to look around corners. Frederick, uh, we're in a period of incredible change right now. And uh, quite obviously, there will be even more change post COVID-19 whenever that comes. In your view, how, how often do boards need to meet? And how do, how do boards know if they're making the right decisions? Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Well, to start off, um, it's good to say, ignore, ignore COVID-19 for a moment and uh, understand a bit the requirements regarding the number of board meetings. I think a good principle that one would follow is that if you organize board meetings too often, they can become stale, unproductive, and a waste of time. If you don't meet often enough, then board members will be disengaged, uninformed, with resulting mismanagement. So one needs to find the balance between those two possibilities. The law does not, because one obviously has to keep in mind statutory requirements, the law does not specify the number of meetings that a company needs to, the board, a board needs to, to meet. However, there are certain basic requirements, such as the approval of the accounts and the recommendation of dividends, which require board approval. So by deduction, at least one meeting which of the board has, has to be held annually to uh, approve the accounts, recommend any dividends and carry out the usual sort of housework which the law um, stipulates. So, so that's looking a, a little bit there uh, sort of from a, a, book, a bookish uh, aspect. Um, I think the baseline that, that one would start off from is that the board needs to meet sufficiently frequently 
to adequately carry out its fiduciary and governance duties. So that has to be the governing principle. Um, if I had to look at the uh, practical examples around me, I can say that at APS, we meet once a month. That means about 10 meetings a year, because obviously in August and December, it is unlikely that the board meets. However, this, this level of, of meetings is, is also defined by the, the size. So in the case of a bank and in the current environment, again, not specifically referring to COVID and all the regulatory uh, matters coming on stream and, and all these issues have been arising, there is certainly a, a tendency for a requirement for boards to meet more often. That is perhaps a bit more specific to banks. Uh, generally, um, I would have thought in a very large, very well organized company, because obviously besides size, one also needs to refer to governance structures. Do you have well proven governance structures? If you have well proven governance structures, the requirement for boards to meet more often is less. Um, so there are these these um, uh, asides, you know, things like well-functioning committees. If you have a number of subcommittees, board subcommittees, which are chaired by a competent chairman, that they meet regularly and carry out the function, that reduces the number of times the full board needs to meet, because then the pressure of certain matters is taken away from the main board discussed at these committee levels and therefore the board will simply need to look at it at a, at, in a much less um, in depth than it would have been if it had to deal with the matter solely on its own. So I would say, um, I, I, as far as I'm aware, the really huge global companies would normally not meet more than four times a year strictly as board to deal with board matters obviously to get to that level of achievement then there are a lot of other side meetings one has to to, to organize so if you want to have a competent board with people who are aware of how the organization works who are familiar with the management because that's another very important aspect how familiar are the members of the board with senior management because at the end of the day there's a lot of trust in the in the relationship how does the board member build a trust relationship with the senior executives um, <clears throat> you, you have the issue of some boards do not even have executive members on the board so again that um, presents a different a different uh, challenge um, so I would expect that although, as I said, that some of the really huge global companies will probably not meet more than four times a year as a formal board meetings, even because of logistics, because global companies would have members of the board coming from different countries and one would have to fix all, all the, the logistics of it. Um, one would have to, to take into account these the relationship with, with, with the executive. I, I would have thought um, a private company of a certain size today with reasonably organized governance structure would probably need to meet eight times a day. <laughs> and then if you bring, if you bring, if you bring COVID into, into the picture, then obviously again, if you have a, a pandemic contingency plan, Fortunately, and it's nothing to my credit, but at APS Bank, we actually had, someone had learned the lesson from somewhere, but we actually had a pandemic um, emergency plan, contingency plan. That makes things much easier because things are de determined in a document. People know what, what uh, they need to do. And once you get the machinery operating, then there you can set the number of meetings that are required. 
again, the, the effect of COVID has been to, to really obliterate certain companies, you know, people in the, in the hospitality trade, for example, where the revenue has stopped completely, have completely different challenges to deal with than a company uh, that is selling masks today. So the board is facing a completely different challenge if it is manufacturing masks or importing masks or whatever. So COVID-19 definitely presents additional um, responsibilities and depending on the, on the organization structure of the entity, how well proven its governance has been over the years, then naturally one would expect boards to meet more often as a result of COVID because it also means if, if your revenue is, is completely gone and, and there, are, there are sectors where the revenue is nil, then the board you, needs to look at its strategy, vision, etc. It has to need look at its immediate short-term um, uh, challenges without ignoring at least the medium term. Because as I said, if you are operating in a successful albeit um, fortuitously because masks are now being sold out or, or gloves have become the order of the day, then you have to deal with that also to see how you're, you're, you're going to, to react to that challenge. <laughs> and, and probably, I think to me, the most important aspect is your stakeholder priority. Today, I, at least from my this limited experience we've had, employee safety, for example, comes very, very high up in the priorities. So you, you probably have seen various emails being sent by, by various companies saying, because we want to, to keep the safety of our employees at, at the top level and we want to get safety of your own safety at the top, then that is something which before may not have been in your priority list um, when you are dealing with strategy or even management decisions. So I would have thought, um, obviously tackling a business which is more or less stopped, ceased operating because of the effects of, of, of uh, public um, uh, government decisions, one would need to look at, at those and with immediate effect, see how they're going to react to those. What is the cash position? How long can you survive? Yesterday, somebody was mentioning the FT. I don't know whether he saw it, but yesterday or the day before, there was a graph with all the airlines showing how, how long the cash they have to survive. So you had some who can survive for 18 months and then some who are basically needing to, to fold up in the next month or so. So again, this, this is a, a topic you would expect the board would want to spend some time. And maybe some of these are not easily solvable. Maybe one board meeting may not find all the solutions. That's where you perhaps put all your ideas together, get the executive to, to get on with it and come back with proposals you would probably need to be talking to your bankers, your providers of finance. They would be wanting to hear from you what you have in mind because they would probably not want to pull the carpet, but at the same time would want to know how you are reacting to, 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 to the challenges that COVID uh, provides. So, as I said at the beginning, there's no magic answer as to how many board meetings should, should be happening. You need to have enough that will allow you to adequately address your responsibilities. And that could be meeting more often than once a month until things become clearer. Because again, today, Sonny was talking about the, the uh, walking on, on the hoof. Yes, today, even the, even the health authorities are not, uh, do not really understand what this virus is all about. They're still finding out what, what, what so if the health authorities themselves are not even sure where we're going with this, this, uh, this, this, pro this problem, then it's even more difficult for, for the board to, 
to uh, come up with with uh, off the cuff solution so i would expect those those companies which are hit really badly by covid would be meeting much more often than those who are doing uh, uh, better again uh, those that are doing those that are doing better would obviously have their own challenges as well so Thank you very much, Frederick, for, for that, those initial remarks. Um, I, I want to turn to someone who, who is actually in the thick of it at the moment. Errol, you, you're the CEO of, of quite a number of companies in, in quite widely differing economic sectors. Um, is, is responding to the crisis your problem? Or can your chair and other directors play a significant role? Uh, and I suppose, uh, if so, how? Thank you, Ed. So, um, good afternoon to everyone. I mean, it's a pleasure to be here with you all from IOD and uh, all the people who are here. So, Ed, um, to come directly to, the, to, you, to reply to your question. Uh, so, I think it's a balance. It's a balance between keeping level-headedness, I think it's crucial in this point of, of time to keep a level-headedness. And yes, I mean, I, 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 will, I, will, not, I, will, I will reply to your question directly. Yes, it's a problem of ours, of course it is. Uh, we are responsible for a portfolio of companies which have, a, um, which have various economic sectors, as you said, from petroleum importation to ferry services, to grain terminal facilities, and um, to waste management. So you can imagine the kind of uh, environment that these companies are working in. So yes, it's a problem which we carry, but of course we balance that out with level-headedness. So uh, you have to take a helicopter view. I think it's crucial to take a helicopter view. Um, I'd li I like to compare our investments. So we represent the investment arm of government of Malta. So I like to re I like to represent our fleet as a fleet of ships, if I may. I mean, made up of individual ships, which are the companies. And as you know, fuel liquidity in this in this point in time is crucial. So, as the gentleman before was saying, I think um, liquidity is key. So, our first and foremost, besides of course the safety of employees and all the rest, which is crucial, is to ensure that the ships have enough fuel in the tanks to keep them going for this period of time because without that fuel uh, businesses will run into trouble given that the companies we have operate in different sectors they are affected in different ways i mean every business has been affected in some way or the other but as you can imagine um, you can you can see that if you have a business or part of a business which is operating in importation of fuel and people are not traveling that much then that might be different to waste management where you know waste is still being collected and processed in a in a in a in a, in a, in a, in a good way like it has always been so i cannot give uh, one, one simple solution uh, for because each business stands on its own but of course as mgi we represent the sum of the many and that's where the value added of mgi comes into the play where we're looking at the where we're looking at the each and every story on its own which is are the companies but we're also adding value and adding value in the process of seeing how we're, we're already looking at post uh, COVID-19. I mean, how we're going to take forward and being also a, a government entity, we're looking also forward how we can add value both at individual level and at economic macro level at, the, at country level. And that's where MGI comes into play. Um, going back to another question you put, how, I mean, in terms of uh, how our chair or directors uh, can come into play there. Of course, we adopt a shareholder view. We, we, we act as asset managers here, I mean, uh, on behalf of government, as agents to government. So in terms of corporate governance, of course, we're here to ensure that boards are, have an adequate board functioning well and, the, and adequate and, uh, and uh, good directorships, and we respect those structures. Um, it's, it's not an easy balance whereby I think, as uh, Sonny said initially, that, I mean, you don't want to over intrude into something but of course you want to keep uh, balance and see what's happening at that level so but first and foremost we respect the structures that there are and assuming that you have uh, good corporate governance in place including um, even the articles of association which dictate i mean how open a board should meet etc so our first uh, responsibility ha is as not only to covid but all throughout to ensure that we have adequate structures in place because let's face it 
Today there's COVID and COVID is, has been a very bad experience, but tomorrow there might be something else. So resiliency and uh, strategy knowledge is, is something that should be inbuilt in our mechanisms because there is always something out there. Of course, the intensities are different and sometimes it's opportunities also. I mean, we're also looking at opportunities. Uh, besides the problems, we look at opportunities. So keeping a good relationship with our board, I mean, I, I of course, I'm the executive of MGI. I sit on a number of boards myself, so I have the, the different perspectives. But, you know, keeping a good relation, I mean, a good, healthy discussion with our board as MGI, and they're keeping a helicopter view of the whole fleet of ships or trying to do our best there, and maintaining the same kind of relationship at linear level, at micro level, with individual companies, is something that we actually do. We hold discussions in this phase with our subsidiaries. Uh, I would say, I mean, what the gentleman was saying is on a timely basis. I mean, ourselves were engaged in discussions on quite, I would say, every couple of weeks. Depends on the business. Some of them need need more, a more greater level of attention, especially those which which have faced liquidity issues. And others, which we still follow up, I mean, on a timely manner. Um, uh, it's also a good opportunity that we present our portfolio for from a CSR perspective. Uh, say, for instance, in a couple of weeks, now we're going to engage with school children, for instance, and we want to come to bring our portfolio to, do, to, to children, I mean, uh, at home, I mean, uh, to expose them to the, the kind of businesses that we're doing. I mean, we, we, I mean, there are opportunities out there. So some things are easier now with technology. So. Yes, COVID is a problem. Yes, our boards are more engaged. Yes, it's our problem. But there are also opportunities. And I think as a country, we have shown that we're resilient. We're quick to react. Yes, we're learning by doing. I mean, I'll be the first one to admit that too also in some instances. But I think looking forward, I think we'll be able to come out of this quite strongly. With the pandemic, uh, Harold, what's the hardest decision you've had to take so far? I know we're putting you on the line here, but you're the only CEO on the on the call. I think we'll give others an insight. Well, what's the hardest decision you've had to take? I wouldn't say I had um, some hard decision in the sense that uh, I would say some decision which is that hard to take. I mean, I wouldn't classify that, but we've been, of course, taking reactive decisions. I mean, this is a situation which this isn't, MGI didn't bring about or somebody brought about. I mean, it's, it's a health crisis. So it's been a reactive decision. So the decisions have been various. I mean, some people have cut down on, on, on you know, on perks. Others have cut, had to cut down on, you know, overtime, things like that. So it's affecting the pockets of some employees. I mean, but it's a reactive. Others, uh, the decisions were different. I mean, they had to reach out to banks to ensure a steady stream of liquidity going in in the businesses. So some services which i although legally they might not be classified as uh, produce uh, producing a vital service but in effect they are so once you you need to maintain a service say a ferry service you can imagine there uh, which you know nobody can imagine a situation where you don't have ships operating but the kind of environment that those services work which is a purely competitive environment where you have income streams going down uh, to, to you know to a zilch or close to it, you know. So sometimes it would need like like surrendering a port ferry there. Uh, so I mean, I would say these are these are the kind of decisions. They are reactive. I mean, I wouldn't say. I mean, this, this is the logic. It's common sense. It's this level headedness which I started off with, and uh, I I believe that this level headedness will stay with us both in this phase of COVID and once we start to come out of it. And once we start to, out, to come out of it, I think this level headedness will lead us to embark into, again, to seek those opportunities and build upon them. I mean, it's very, it's a reactive strategy. Um, I think the cycles, which normally are associated with strategy, where might, you might need some time to develop something. In this instance, uh, I think some of the strategies, the cycle, the strategic cycle has been cut down to days or shorter. I mean, because it's, a, it's reactive uh, in some instances, of course, especially when it comes to liquidity and ensuring that uh, companies go forward as a business concern. In others, where liquidity is not an issue, especially there, um, it's different. I mean, there, one, there was, uh, you, know, you, know, you sit in a more comfortable position and uh, it's easier there. So uh, that's the kind of environment we, we had. That. That, that's, uh, I think, giving us a, a very clear line of sight there, Harold. 
Uh, Sunny, uh, one for you. Are, are good chairs more important than ever as organizations face this COVID-19 storm? Okay, I, um, I lost my microphone for a moment. <clears throat> yeah, thank you very much for the question, Edwin. Look, um, good chairs are important always. <clears throat> if a chair is not good, he's totally useless as far as the board is concerned and the corporation is concerned. Uh, so I would turn the question a little bit around, if I may. How do current chairs get better? Uh, at crisis management because from from a boardroom perspective because this is what we're talking about you know managing in a crisis operating in a war I think that the um, by this time hopefully most people sitting in the chair uh, would have been come quite familiar with their colleagues around the boardroom table and because it's one of the primary responsibilities of a board uh, the hiring of the CEO and the familiarity with the senior management team. So the chair should be able to interact with his colleagues and also with the senior members of the management team. To what I said earlier, you know, there is this, obviously this division, the board is the board and the management is the management. And the board is there to set the tone and to make sure that the strategy which the board has decided upon is being followed. But um, taking up from, from uh, what everybody else is saying, obviously, uh, especially what Frederick said, obviously the board is at this point in time meeting more often. And I would expect the chair to be in contact on a daily basis. If I was doing my old job uh, or if whatever, I, on a daily basis, I would want to have a report about the cash burn on a daily basis of the company. That's absolutely point number one. That's one of the key, um, key uh, indicators that, that I would want to look at. Second one is I would want to have a look at the cash flow on a weekly basis and compare it to what would have been uh, presented to the board at that particular board meeting when the cash flow projections would have been would have been approved. Those are two key indicators, I think, which should alert the board if the company is going according to plan or if the company is deviating from the plan. And the good chair would immediately spot that together with a few other items of, of, of information which he will be getting in conversations with the chair of the audit committee and the chair of the risk committee who will be feeding into the in, into the chairman um, what is coming up what is being kicked up to their particular committees and the chair is then going to use his judgment um, to share it with, with his colleagues or to call the executive team through the chief executive in order to have a very, very, very uh, firm handle on what is happening in the company. To my mind, um, to, um, to Harold's uh, example uh, of, of the ship, this is very, very turbulent weather. In fact, the ship is sailing through a huge storm. And in a huge storm, you need to be able to be very nimble with your maneuvering, because otherwise you might overturn. So um, coming to the beginning of coming back to your question, the, the, I'm very sorry, you have a company at this point in time, especially uh, a, a large corporate, doesn't have the chair that it should have at this particular moment in time then they are in serious trouble. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Sunday. We, we uh, have a, a rule with the 859 Club that the session ends uh, within 60 minutes. So we did start a couple of minutes late. Uh, 
and I will just try and save a little bit of time. Frederick, I, I'm just going to jump to a, a question uh, and pick up on, on your opening remarks. Um, what's, what's the role of corporate governance in handling COVID-19? Well, corporate governance is important in any set of circumstances. So <clears throat> it would be a surprise that having proper governance structures in place would make the task of facing such an uncertain set of, of uh, circumstances around you a little bit more um, uh, calmer and easier to, to, to take on. Um, as I said earlier, having the board uh, um, built up a, a relationship with the senior executives over time, because that doesn't happen because all of a sudden you have this great big challenge, maybe COVID-19 or be something else. So that is part of governance, that the exe senior executive and the board members are working together in a cohesive manner. And that, of course, assumes that they've built up a relationship of trust, which takes time to build. And therefore, as I didn't have the opportunity to expand earlier, other than the board meetings, you would expect to have certain meetings called deep dives, for example, where one would look at a particular aspect of the organization and spend some time solely focusing on that, on that, um, on that topic. Those are the ways that one would be building relationships with the senior executives. And therefore, when you come across a challenge such as this one, it comes in good stead on how you're going to, to deal with it. You would have expect, if you've built up a proper governance, a governance structure, directors would be relying very much on the chairman, as Sonny said, to be liaising regularly with the, senior, the CEO and the senior executive to understand what are the key issues that need to be debated and the sort of timeline you have in reacting to these to these uh, issues. Um, so again, as I said, having the, the proper governance structure, um, being able to, to rely on the chairs of the various committees. Sonny mentioned the audit and the risk committee, which are very much in the banking world, but in other, in other, um, uh, in other organizations, you'll find the equivalent um, uh, and, and others perhaps. And that would be crucial for the chairman to be able to to set about when to organize the meet the board meetings, what to discuss, and and arrange for the proper um, documentation to be supplied by the executive because that's another aspect of the board meetings. Board meetings don't happen by people sitting around the table and having a coffee and having a chat. Uh, in the preparation of a, for a board meeting, there's a lot of time and effort which is undertaken by, by the senior executive to ensure that the, the board is fully aware of what's going on and with the detail so that eventually at the board meeting, the discussion is limited to the more important aspects resulting from the documentation which is supplied by the, by the executive. So again, if you're going to rely on documentation supplied by the executive, that in itself uh, assumes that there is a proper governance structure, that proper actions have been taken originally by the board in, in appointing the CEO and going to the process when the CEO appoints his senior executives, which will make the decisions easier when you are faced with challenges such as COVID-19. Um, thanks for that one, Frederick. Uh, I, I'm going to bounce back to you, Sonny, uh, and then maybe ask the same question to, to Harold. But um, how, how, do, how do we define an effective board in this current situation? Well, I, um, off the top of my head, I think 
an effective board to my mind uh, at this point in time with all of that everything is happening around us is a board that has been in place for some time which uh, that to my mind means that they have got used to each other they they know each other very well they are very confident in picking the phone up and uh, calling each other not waiting for board meetings and whatever and quizzing each other or giving uh, opinions or suggestions or whatever don't forget a board is the sum of the different knowledges around the boardroom table so there is a wealth of knowledge of information um, a lot of them would have you know especially if we're talking about senior corporate they would have a background in in management and in senior management um, and in a variety of enterprises so <clears throat> so their knowledge their different knowledge is invaluable uh, in a times like this because they they have the right uh, the right tools in their brain to be analytical to ask the right questions to look at the right paragraphs in a report if they're looking at reports and to keep in touch at this point in time boards don't need to be formally uh, around the table or as is more the case these days um, you know on zoom or whatever but they need to be able to talk to each other whenever they have a doubt to whatever they have a question mark and this is where the chairman has to coordinate it all because then the chairman has to whether it is a challenge whether it is information whether it is a suggestion um the liaise with with the senior executive team always through the chief executive and this is how the interaction at times of crisis can to my mind work very well <clears throat> boards need to be talking to each other constantly we're in the thick of it so they need to have this constant conversation exchanging ideas questioning each other hopefully always having the chairman in the loop nowadays it's so easy with with the technical ability and facilities that we have keeping the chairman in the loop so that the chairman has everybody's ideas going around in his mind and then he can distill them down to the chief executive to me that's how i would like to think a very effective board would would be functioning as we are speaking as we are talking thank you sonny um uh, harold i'm i'm going to jump off uh off piste here for a moment, but there, there's a very interesting question in the chat stream. And it, the question is this, it says, how can a director know up to what point can employee retention be prioritized and supported? And then a comment uh, goes on further saying, in these times, it's probably impossible to sustain the three Ps people, planet, profit, but just focus on the cash position, which can help the organization survive. Is that the director's primary duty? Mm -hmm. uh, so I think the gentleman there has put a couple of good questions um, together in that uh, paragraph there of questions and ads. So, um, so um, first and foremost, coming to the first one on employee retention. So, I mean, it's very specific to a company. I mean, uh, specific to, to the specificities of a company. I mean, I can't give one simple uh, uh, thing, but you know, we're going, companies are going concerns. So a long-term vision as a going concern has to be kept in mind. Um, and sure, is the, is, is, is the retention that will fit in within the general strategy of a company where it's heading, even financially and even where it's going to head. So certainly employee retention will come into play. I mean, we've seen this for, uh, with, with airline industries are over. I mean, so airline industries have taken, you know, some quick measures, some of them, you know, on employee retention, where they've seen, we hear about, uh, it's going to take a number of years for airlines to recover uh, their, their new business. Some people mentioned 2021, 22 or, or further. I mean, so certainly it was, I mean, if I was sitting in those shoes, I mean, it's quite, it doesn't make that much sense, is it? I mean, if you're looking at the recovery at 2022, 
Why should we keep, uh, I mean, uh, risking the company falters and keeping the whole lo a lot of employees with you? And assuming, assuming there is no government support, which there is, and I'm not speaking uh, locally, which, I mean, locally we've been doing, I think, quite well, and we've ranked even very well, I mean, on, on Columbia University, uh, but I'm speaking generally. So it's very specific. So as long as you, you know that employees, I mean, you know, besides the money, besides the productivity, these employees are part of the family. I mean, I mean, you can't just look at people as numbers. So these have families and they're part of the team. So as long as you're able to see the good weather behind the storm, or somehow you start to see some start, you know, they say there is a silver lining behind every cloud, and you have the cash, the cash burnout has been very well mentioned by Sonny before, and as long as you're able to taper off, I mean, you know that you're able to survive, you're, you're start to predict that you're able to survive the storm. Maybe take some cuts. I mean, you have to be flexible here, both as a company and at the individual employee level, if need be, then I don't think that employee retention, I mean, we shouldn't go out there and say, listen, it's the time to, 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 to fire people because that would be a crazy thing to do. But on the other hand, it's like I said before, a level-headedness. If a business is facing significant issues, and this is where the discussion on corporate governance comes in, and you want to ensure that you have a set of rules in place, not now, but before. I mean, I mean, I mean if, if companies are developing their corporate governance now, and I think the weather is not a storm, then it's a tsunami there, probably. Probably it's a tsunami there, and I'm not sure they will be able to survive. So, uh, so uh, that's, that's the first one. Coming to the second question. Um, so, yes, I mean, employee retention is, is, a priority, is a priority to try to retain as much as your stuff as possible. Of course it is. I mean, that's, that's, uh, that's, that's, I think we owe it to the stakeholders. And employees are stakeholders in the companies. I mean, human capital is not easy. Uh, at, I mean, just to let go of human capital, it's not that easy. I mean, uh, service-oriented businesses and others, I mean, the human capital, uh, the hit even on the psyche of the individuals, both at the individual level and collectively, it takes time to recover that. I mean, it, now I've read somewhere in the, you know, it's the time where, you know, good companies show where they stand with their employees. And I think now, as long as good companies can weather it and, and, and they do their best to weather it, then I think it's the time that we stand with our employees as the best possible. The second one is, I think cash at the moment, Yes, I mean, liquidity and cash burnout are perhaps vital, vital statistics and vital numbers that are being uh, looked into on a daily basis, um, and that's crucial. But I wouldn't say, I would say cash and people. So on a daily basis, uh, if the board needs to be communicating amongst itself and with senior management, and senior management is communicating with the staff, so the f people, you know, at the moment, many people are working from home, others are not. The sense of belonging will, will, is crucial. I mean, the uncertainty out there is a lot. People are uncertain in health, they're uncertain economically. So I think we owe it both to at board levels and, you know, at senior executive level to our staff that we try our best to bring certainty into this uncertainty. I'm not saying we're, we're superheroes, we're not. But we try our best. I mean, uh, if you look at what's happening on the health, you know, Professor Gauci each day, I'm sure she has her uncertain moment, but she brings that, you know, that stability kind of, of thing. And I think it's crucial that we do the same both at board level and at executive, that our staff, they look up, they know that there is someone to look up to, you know, as the chairman, the CEO, these are the, perhaps the main two figures within an organization, and the directors themselves. And so I would say, the profit side then, the profit side will come. And the, the profit side is, at the moment, is perhaps to take, adopt a long-term view and try, I mean, to see whether there are opportunities to take, to take into consideration. I am pretty sure, you know, when you look at the market, you know, the market had a hit. I mean, you know, S&P 500, perhaps on, I think it was 16th of March, I think it was a record drop. But at the same time, some companies say Netflix, I mean, the, the, you might have seen a different opposing view. So, uh, so, it's, so it's crucial that companies look into whether they, I mean, at the moment we're using Zoom. Probably Zoom never had it this good, probably. Um, so whereas others, like airline industries, you know, are, are close to faulting. So if you can re-engage in a meaningful way, which makes sense to your business and strategically 
steer your ship in a way towards the future, where it makes sense to seize those opportunities. It's useless going ahead and uh, you know adopting the same head that applied yesterday, because yesterday has changed. Maybe not in totality, but you know, yesterday is useless crying foul. You know, today is COVID. This is a reality. So let's look ahead at the realities of tomorrow, of COVID, post-COVID. Some, I'm pretty sure so that some of the realities that we experienced in the past will come back. Well, I mean, people now, as you see, traffic is starting to, uh, go up, to go up again. So I'm pretty sure some of the normality, uh, people say the normality is gone. I'm not sure that the normality, all the normalities will be gone. I mean, you know, adopting a long-term view, I'm sure that, pretty sure that some of the normality will return back. But I'm pretty sure also that we'll see some of the changes. And it is within those changes that we need to see the opportunities to go on profit, in my view. The third one is the planet. And this is ties up very well nicely, I think, with, you know, the ASG framework. So we have the, you know, uh, for the moment, perhaps for us, it seems to be an aura out there. You know, the economic, the corporate government, the social. But I think it is time we have proven that climate change, for instance, we, I mean, we have seen numbers on climate change. We would have never, myself, I would have never dreamed about. You know, perhaps before we used to find these car free days, which were perhaps more, some of us would have seen as a burden. But now, you know what? We can do it. I mean, if, if uh, you know, these are these Google tracking things for people, how much they're moving about, and it showed that COVID has brought down movement. India, I think in last week or this week itself, has uh, recorded a record, uh, you know, decrease in pollution. So COVID, you know, it's, it's maybe me who tries to look in the, the best things in, in the worst situations or the opportunities. But I think, yes, I mean, this has been a hit for sure. It has been, you know, uncertainty. Personally, I'd never recall something like this. We don't have said because we don't know, you know, the worst thing is we don't know when it's going to end. Because the uncertainty, if, if people told us, listen, you need to stay home in, a month at, in home, and then it's over. I mean, but it's not that. I mean, so it's the lingering feeling. Uh, when will it end? Will it end? Will there be a second wave? Will there be a third wave? I mean, all these questions. So within this is the certainty element. And I think so the liquidity and people element are crucial. But yet the opportunity and the profit are there. And it doesn't mean that to make a profit, there isn't the planet uh, thing, because the planet thing, I think, is there too. Okay, Harold, thank you for, for that. I, we're out of time, uh, everybody. And if, if each of you perhaps could very succinctly, in less than one minute each, uh, give us your, uh, what you would like the audience to to remember about what you've said today about boards. What, what is it? Uh, we'll start with you, Harold, and then uh, we'll follow with Frederick and end on, on Sunny. Ed, um, my message is, if I may, is level-headedness. I think we have a storm, which Sunny rightfully said. We have ships out there, uh, ships out there, you know, sailing to this storm. Uh, yes, I mean, it much depends whether the ship day one had a good engine, whether it had a thick hull, or whether it had already water sinking in. I mean, so it's, I don't have one measure fits all because it is very specific to the circumstances. But I think what is crucial is level headedness, quick reaction to keep an open eye. I think keeping an open eye to what's happening because the, the situation is changing and it can change very fast. Uh, hopefully for the better, hopefully for the better. But, you know, you have to keep an eye that things might turn a bit turning because, you know, if a second wave comes around, this is not a precedent that something which we can control totally. We try our best as a, as, as a country and, you know, as a global level. But, you know, this is the uncertainty part, which we can do our best, but there is always that side. So it's the level-headedness. And I think crucial is the communication at. I think it's, as people are staying more at home and people tend to be you know, more in a, you know, ostracized, it's crucial that we have communication flows between boards, between amongst senior management and the board and with employees and with others and us as individual levels, you know, the same what happens in families with friends and it's crucial that we reach out. Also this communication, hopefully, you know, if we can, and you know, if you don't get it right day one, uh, you know, if you keep trying, and you'll get it right the day too. I mean, that's it for me. Frederick, your your part is. 
if I may say a couple of words, it, it's this COVID-19 just shows how important governance is. And with governance, I mean, it's why the sense uh, companies that had clear cut vision of culture, stakeholder priority, accountability, relationships would probably fare much better facing the COVID-19 and similar uh, challenges than those who would have paid lip service and normally refer to governance as being uh, uh, for nerds and being, you know, book bookish stuff and which is not really relevant to the way a business is run. I think people who have these items of governance in place for a period of time, not you can't bring them up, to, you know, within a day or so, those people are, are in a better position to face challenges of this level of, of seriousness. Many thanks, Patrick. Sunny? We're, we're not hearing you, Sunny. Could you switch on your mic? Uh, Is it okay? Right. Yep. Right. We're Sorry about that. No problem. No, I'll, I'll be very short, very succinct. Um, my parting, my parting taught for colleagues, especially for colleagues who are actively uh, members of boards. At a time like this, the first accountability and the first and paramount responsibility of, of a board and its individual members, and let's not forget that the responsibility is joint and several, is the survivability uh, of the business. I think everything else falls uh, into that one consideration. And boards must not shy away from taking all those measures and all those actions, which in their opinion, will uh, make sure that their business survives and moves on to fight another day. Thank you very much for listening in. Well, that, that's all we have time for. Uh, thanks to our <coughs> panelists, APS Bank Chair Frederick Masu Bonici, uh, Harold Bonici, not related in any way, by the way, mm -hmm. CEO at Malta Government Investments, uh, Sonny Portelli, who's Director and Chair of the Audit Committee at BMIG. Uh, thank you all for sharing your thoughts today, and thanks to you all in the audience for being with us. The recording of this session will be posted in all of IOD Malta's social media channels next week, as soon as possible, if you'd like to listen to it again. And our next session uh, will be on May the 28th, and that's going to be moderated by Dr. Roberta Lepre. And it will be asking about how can government governance be used uh, to, as a tool during the COVID-19 pandemic. Thanks again for being with us. Thanks everyone. <laughs>